All right, folks, uh, I want to welcome you to Pastor's Point of View number, I think it's 172. 172. Well, yeah, and today is uh, July the 9th, 2021, and Brother Jim, we're going to do something today. First of all, I'm Dr. Andy Woods. I'm the pastor teacher here at Sugarland Bible Church. I'm back with my friend, colleague, fellow elder, um, associate pastor, Dr. Jim McGowan, and we're going to do something, Brother Jim, a little different um, today, but this has been long building. We've done this before, and and people have sent in a lot of correspondences. So today we are going to do our mail bag segment. I wish we had that sound from the Adams family when <laughs> yeah. the mail came in. I could just hit a button. There you go. We'll, we'll work on that. <laughs> there you go. And these are questions that you have submitted to us. And so these are your questions. We're going to tell you at the end of the show today how you can correspond with us and send in your Bible questions. But we have, if you look at our opening slide here, we've got a list of 10 things to talk about. And so we're going to try to move through these fast today, Lord willing. But the first question, Brother Jim, relates to the fullness of the Gentiles. And yes, sir. Can you Can you read that question to us? All right. Question number one says... There are some who say the rapture cannot happen until the fullness of the Gentiles happens. To my understanding, that scripture refers to those who come out of the tribulation and has nothing to do with the church being raptured. I would like clarification on this, please. All right. Now, the key passage that talks about the fullness of the Gentiles wrapping up the church age is Romans 11 verses 25 and 26. So what does that verse say? All right, we'll be reading from the New American Standard Version 95 update, Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. So Paul the Apostle says, I want to tell you a mystery. And that word mystery in Romans 11 verse 25 is the key phrase to unpacking the fullness of the Gentiles and not confusing it with something that's going to happen later in history prophetically, yes. uh, Revelation 7. So let's start with that, Brother Jim. What is a mystery? You'll notice that we've got mystery defined here from Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of Old Testament and New Testament Words. And what is that definition of mystery? All right. The definition in the New Testament, it, the word mysterion, denotes not the mysterious as with the English word, but that which, being outside the range of unassisted natural apprehension, can be made known only by divine revelation, and is made known in a manner and at a time appointed by God, and to those who are illumined by his Spirit. So, close quote, so this is the Greek word mystery from the Greek word, um, well, the English word mystery from the Greek word mysterion. And it's very confusing because in English, mystery means one thing, mm -hmm. but in Greek, the language that the New Testament was written in, it meant something totally different. Yeah, it's not like, it's not like a mystery novel. Right. See, when no. we use the word mystery in English, it's like a, a Columbo. Yeah. You know, you don't know who the bad guy is until the last, you know, two minutes. Yeah. And so it's something that has to be searched out with great diligence. And actually, the opposite meaning is in Greek. Uh, in Greek, a mystery is something veiled, prior, previously veiled. Previously, yeah. Now it's it's like an uncovering. Mm -hmm. It's been brought out so the whole world can see it. Yes. And this is the mystery that Paul is talking about in Romans 11, verse 25. In fact, Paul the Apostle defines the word mystery that way. Notice what Paul says in Colossians 1, verse 26. Colossians 1.26, that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to us. So a mystery according to not just vines, but more importantly, Paul, something hidden prior, 
but now it's been manifested. Yes. And quite frankly, Brother Jim, the whole <clears throat> church age, beginning on the day of Pentecost, this unique period of time that we've been living in for the last 2,000 years, between the day of Pentecost and the rapture, you don't you find no disclosure of that in the Old Testament. Right. And only a few <clears throat> faint hints of it in the Gospels. Yes. Yes. And Paul's task, as he wrote 13 letters, was to fill out this era of time that we're living in. Right. So the church age is a mystery. We see that in Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 6. What does he say there? Ephesians 3, 3 through 6. That by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So the mystery is this new man that we're in. Yes of fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether they're Jew or Gentile, right. were on equal footing in a new spiritual man yes. called the church age. That's a that's a mystery. You know, that's an unknown truth before Paul wrote about it. And right. now it's been brought out into the open. And Paul says the exact same thing in verse nine, same chapter of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians three nine, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things? So it's exciting. We're living in this mystery. Yes. This new disclosure. Yes. So with that background in mind, let's go back to Romans 11. Paul says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. I like what he says here, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then he says, Here's the mystery. A hardening has happened to Israel, but he calls it here a partial, partial. hardening. Mm -hmm. So currently, national Israel, not that an individual Jew can't get saved, mm -hmm. but nationally, the nation of Israel is in a state of blindness. Yes. They, they've been in that state since they turned Christ over to Rome, mm -hmm. really for execution. So they're in hardening right now, but it's partial. And that hardening is is going to continue on until, so it doesn't happen forever, right? until a condition is met. And what's the condition? Until the full number of Gentiles has come in. Mm -hmm. So once the very last Gentile that's destined to be reached with the gospel in the church age is reached, then the Gentiles will be made full, the body of Christ will be made complete, Yes, the bride of Christ will be made complete, and then, I would put the rapture there in between verse 25 and verse 26, the church mm -hmm. is translated to heaven. And then God will complete his unfinished work with Israel, which he has to do because there are a lot of promises he, he's made concerning Israel right. that have never been fulfilled. Yes. So the mystery isn't God is going to um, remove the blindness from Israel one day. That's not the mystery. That's already been revealed. Yes. Many places in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Amos 9, verses 11 through 15, just as one example. And the, and the mystery isn't God is going to use the Jews again to reach the world with the truth. Mm -hmm. We already know that's going to happen from Isaiah 42, verse 6, Isaiah 49, verse 6, countless other passages. That's not the mystery. The mystery is this. The mystery is Israel will continue in their state of spiritual blindness mm -hmm. until the church is complete. Right. Then the church will be removed to heaven, and then God will put his hand back on Israel and bring them to faith and use them to reach the world. Yes. So when he talks here about the fullness of the Gentiles, that's what he's talking about. And you'll notice Revelation 7 verse 9 has nothing to do with this mystery that we're talking about. Uh, Revelation 7 verse 9 is talking about God using Israel again to bless the world, right. which will happen in the tribulation. Yes. 
And that passage is in Revelation 7, verse 9. What does that say? Revelation. And, and, and this is after the body has been made complete and the church is in mm-hmm. heaven. Yes, sir. Revelation 7, 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. So this is an innumerable multitude that's been reached by who? The 144,000 Jewish evangelists coming from each of the 12 tribes. In fact, we have this chart here from uh, my friends Mark Hitchcock and Thomas Ice, a book they wrote called The Truth Behind Left Behind. And they've got a distinction between the 144,000 and the multitude. Mm Mm-hmm. 144,000 are mentioned in the first part of the chapter. The multitude that's reached is mentioned in the second part of the chapter. The 144,000 are numbered, exactly 12,000 from each tribe. The multitude, as you just read, is innumerable. Mm -hmm. The 144,000 are Jews. The multitude is all nations. Mm -hmm. The 144,000 are sealed. Most of that multitude there is slain. That's why they're progressively revealed as going into heaven, because they're being martyred via the hands of the Antichrist. And the 144,000 are sealed before the tribulation, and the multitude is converted out of the tribulation. So all of that to say, don't confuse in your mind Revelation 7 verse 9 with the fullness of the Gentiles in Romans 11, verses 25 and 26. Right. Those are talking about two totally different concepts. Yes, sir. The for, the uh, Ro- Romans 11, 25 and 26 is talking about the church being made complete, leading to the rapture. Mm-hmm. Revelation 7, verse 9 is talking about the number of people, earth dwellers, that are going to be reached in the tribulation period via the 144,000. Mm-hmm. So the latter is not a mystery. That concept is already found in the Old Testament. The former, Israel being in a state of blindness until the last Gentile of the church age comes to Christ, that is a mystery. That's, that's something mystery. brand new. Yeah, right. So what would you add to no, that answer? No, that, that's right on. That's a great chart, too. I really like that. Yeah. That's helpful. So, question two. What does question number two say that the folks have submitted? Question number two. What are your thoughts? Or what what are your thoughts concerning a possible time gap between the rapture and the tribulation? Okay. So you'll notice here Daniel nine verse twenty seven, which is our verse that gives us the outline of the tribulation period. Um, You want to read that verse to us? Daniel 9, 27. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So what starts the tri- seven-year tribulation is a peace treaty of some kind right. between the Antichrist and unbelieving Israel. And once that happens, it's exactly a seven-year countdown until Jesus returns in his second advent. Here we have it in chart form. Um, we have Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, which gives us an overview of the tribulation. You'll notice it starts with the peace treaty. And exactly three and a half years later, the Antichrist will desecrate the Jewish temple. And three and a half years after that, you'll have the personal return of Jesus Christ. So why can't this peace treaty be entered into while the church is still here? Um, The answer to that question you'll find in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, where it mentions the restrainer. Mm -hmm. What does that say? 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. So the Antichrist can't even come upon the scene to enter into this peace treaty Mm -hmm. as long as the restrainer is present. Correct. So one of these days, Paul says, the restrainer is going to be taken away. Yes. Now, who's the restrainer? Well, 
I, I'm not going to go into length on this. You can find our proof of it in prior shows we've done in my Rapture series, for mm-hmm. example, that I'm currently doing. You know, to make a long story short, the restrainer is the work of the Holy Spirit through the church. Right. So as long as the church is here, this peace treaty can't be entered into. Mm-hmm. But one of these days, that restraint will be gone, rapture, mm-hmm. and then Satan's man of the hour will come forward and enter into the peace treaty. Right. Now, if you look at most of our charts, for example, here's a chart we use all the time called Prophecy Panorama. You'll notice that we put the rapture real close to the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period. Right. And I guess what I'd like to communicate to people is that's an assumption. Right. Do we know that for sure? No. Almost every prophecy chart in modern times that's been developed, you know, assumes that. Mm -hmm. But we don't know that. No, we don't. That's why I am really appreciative of this chart here by our friend J.B. Hickson. He's got a chart here called the end times. And you see on the left-hand side of the chart, he's got the rapture. And then as you move right, he's got the beginning of the tribulation. Mm -hmm. And in between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation, it says their preparation. Right. So he is not buying a lot of our assumptions that the two are going to take place in close succession. Right. Now, they could take place in close succession, Mm -hmm. but we don't know that. That's my point. And it is very interesting, Brother Jim, that when you go back into older commentaries, they did not assume the close proximity of the two events the way we do. Mm -hmm. So here's a quote from Bullinger in 1909 in his Revelation commentary. And it's very interesting. What does he say here? All right, quoting, And Babylon, though fallen gradually and very low, has never suffered such a destruction. There is only one conclusion, that in the interval of, say, some 30 or more years between the removal of the church and the last week of Daniel's prophecy, it will be revived and exceed all its former magnificence. Now, isn't that interesting? He Mm -hmm. says between rapture and peace treaty, there could be 30 years. Yeah. Now, no, almost nobody says that today, right. but these older guys thought that way. Mm-hmm. And here's a similar quote from Clarence Larkin, written in 1919. All right, quoting again, but I hear the protest, how can you say we be expecting Jesus to come at any moment if the city of Babylon must be rebuilt before he can come? There is not a word in Scripture that says that Jesus cannot come and take away his church until Babylon is rebuilt. The church may be taken out of the world 25 or even 50 years before that. (laughs) So he's he's saying between the rapture and the peace treaty, there could be 25 to 50 years. Mm -hmm. Now, why are Bullinger and Larkin saying this? Because they're believers in what I believe and I think what you believe that's part of my book that's coming out very soon called Babylon, the prophetic bookends of history, mm-hmm. that Babylon is going to be rebuilt. Absolutely. And people say, well, if, ba- if we've got to wait for Babylon to be rebuilt, then that postpones the rapture. Mm-hmm. And Larkin and Bullinger are both saying not necessarily. Right. Because there could be a gap of time of, what does he say, 20 to 50 years, yeah. Yeah. 30 years yeah. between the two, and Babylon could be built in the gap. Mm-hmm. So I guess what I'm trying to say is what, you know, the question is, what are your thoughts concerning a possible time gap between the rapture and the tribulation? My thoughts are that very well could be. Absolutely. But on the other end of the stick, maybe it won't be that way. That's right. Maybe our modern charts are accurate. Or then again, maybe our modern charts are not accurate and Bollinger and, and Larkin are accurate. It's good to be definitive. <laughs> yeah. So I don't really know. Um, no, we don't I, know. I'm just saying when you get into prophecy, just be careful about making assumptions. Mm-hmm. Uh, we put we put a lot of things together via assumption. Yes. And there is no biblical text that tells us of a gap. I mean, we assume there's going to be some kind of gap, and it mm-hmm. never tells us how long it's going to be. Right. So I think, Brother Jim, is that's why there's going to be a half half hour silence in heaven because we're all going to be readjusting our prophecy charts, right? Burning our notes (laughs) and rewriting them. 
where I'll be able to go up to people and jab them and say, I told you guys, you should have listened to me. And, uh, of course, I will not be doing that in a prideful way because I'll be in a resurrected body without a sin sin nature. Or they're going to be coming up and jabbing at me saying, man, you sure goofed it up. So (laughs) let's all take a deep breath out there and let's not be dogmatic where God isn't dogmatic. Exactly. Well, that's really the issue. Yes, yes. All right, let's go to question three, and this takes us over to John 11, verses 25 and 26. What does question three say? All right, question three, is John eleven twenty-five through 26 a rapture passage? So what does John eleven twenty-five and 26 say? I guess we should read that. Yes. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will li- will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Now, we've received a number of emails from people asking us, is that the rapture? Um, well, first of all, what, what do we know about it? We know that John's gospel revolves around seven signs. Yes. The first sign is the changing of the water into wine at Cana of Galilee. Mm -hmm. And the last sign, which is where we find John 11, is Mm -hmm. the uh, raising, uh, maybe the resuscitation, I would be best to say, because he came out of the tomb, Lazarus did, in a non-resurrected body. Mm -hmm. We assume he died again. Mm -hmm. Um, the, The resuscitation of Lazarus from the dead. And John skillfully weaves these seven signs together along with seven I am statements. This is I am statement number five, where Jesus is making a claim about himself. Yes. To convince his readers that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, Mm -hmm. who has the power to give eternal life to anyone that will believe in him. Yes. And so this would be I am statement number five, where Jesus claims to be the resurrection and the life. That's where we find our statement right? Um, in John 11, verses 25 and 26. Now, one of the most, so is this the rapture? Well, one of the most important things to understand about the ministry of Jesus is when Jesus had his life and ministry, he had it under the prior dispensation of the law. Yes. The church age, when Jesus was ministering on the earth 2,000 years ago, had not started yet. It was still a mystery. It was still a mystery. And Jesus makes a few hints that it's coming, Mm -hmm. uh, but we've really got to wait till Paul to get a full-blown explanation of it right so it's don't read church age ideas too aggressively into the ministry of christ Mm -hmm. because jesus didn't minister in the church age he ministered under the prior dispensation of the law right you'll notice the book of galatians Mm -hmm. chapter 4 verse 4 Uh, we don't have a slide on that but just a, a, a verse what does that say galatians 4 4 but when the fullness of the time came God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So you ask a lot of people, you ask denominational leaders, when did the church age start? And they'll say with the birth of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's totally incorrect. It says it right here that Jesus was born under the law. So it says. So his ministry took place under the Mosaic law. That's right. Um, That's why he says things like, the way he says them, for example, what does he say there in Luke 17, verse 14? All right. This is the cleansed lepers that were cleansed. mm -hmm. It's recorded in Luke 17, 14. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. So (laughs) why would he tell these lepers to go show yourselves to the priests? Exactly. Because that's what the Mosaic Law said lepers are supposed to do. That's right. And Jesus ministering under the prior dispensation of the law was honoring, you know, the Mosaic Law. Yes, sir. And this does not change. Take a look at our outline of John. Here's a five-part synthetic outline of John. You have a heavenly genealogy, John 1. Mm -hmm. And then the end of John 1 through the end of John. John 11 is his public ministry, and that's where you have the seven signs. Yes. 
then in chapter 12, see in chapter 11, this hasn't happened yet. Right. But in chapter 12, he's going to publicly present himself to the nation as their Messiah in what we call Palm Sunday. And then everything's going to change. There's going to be a total change in his ministry at this verse here in John 12, verse 37. And what does John 12, verse 37 say? All right. John 12, 37. But though he had prefor- performed rather so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. So once that verse takes place, it's clear that the nation is going to reject his messianic authority. Right. <clears throat> so the die is cast, mm-hmm. and it's clear he's going to be turned over to Rome by Israel for execution. And it's not until that point in time that he gives any hint of the church age. Mm -hmm. Uh, He starts to develop the church age in what's called the upper room discourse, where you have seed doctrines um, concerning the church that Paul the Apostle is going to water and bring to full fruition Mm -hmm. in his 13 letters. Mm -hmm. Yes, Until the upper room discourse takes place, There's no knowledge of the church. Right. But once you move into the upper room discourse, then he starts revealing things about the church, including how the church age will end. And you don't have any clear prophecy of the rapture until John 14, 1 through 4. And what does that say? John 14, 1 through 4. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Now we've got the rapture. Yes, sir. In the context of a lot of other teachings that relate to the church, like the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will be with you forever. Mm -hmm. But one of these things he says is the church age is going to end, our age is going to end, because he's going to come and take us to the Father's house. That that is the rapture of the church. So that's where you find the rapture in Christ's teachings, not in John 11. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you understand that based on just looking at the outline of John's gospel. Right. Okay. Now, having said all that, I still believe John 11, you know, I am the resurrection and the life, etc., is indirectly referring to the rapture because it's a, it's not directly referring to the rapture, but it's indirectly referring to the rapture. Why? Because Jesus claimed to be the resurrection and the life. And when you look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 23, he claims to be the first fruits. Uh-huh. And this is how the Jews did their harvest. The first fruits came in, and it gave them confidence that the rest of the harvest, whether it's the general harvest or the gleanings, would come in as well. Yes. And Christ, when he rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, is the first fruits. That's right. And can you just read verse 20 and verse 23? Sure. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, we'll read 20 and 23. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. So when he says first fruits, what he's saying is my resurrection from the dead is going to guarantee everyone else's resurrection right. from the yes. dead. Amen. So here's our chart. It's called God's Resurrection Program. It's a good chart. And we notice that believers are resurrected in three waves. Just like Israel's harvest, first fruits, general harvest, gleanings Mm -hmm. came in in three waves. So Christ rose first. Yes. His resurrection proves I'm going to get my resurrected body when? At the point of the rapture. Mm -hmm. That's for all church-age believers. Everyone that's believed in Christ from the day of Pentecost until the rapture is part of that unique man that Paul explained called the the church or the body of Christ. And then lastly, there's going to be the gleanings, and you're going to have Old Testament saints and Daniel 12, verse 2, and tribulation martyrs 
Revelation 20, verses 4 and 5, receiving their resurrected bodies at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So if you want to say John 11 is indirectly referring to the rapture, because his resurrection guarantees our resurrection at the rapture, then I'm fine with that. Right. If you're going to tell me, though, that John 11, <laughs> verses 25 and 26 is a specific direct prophecy of the rapture, we would have to say, no, that's not true, because you'd be reading all of it discourse truth back into a time period before Israel had ever, he even had the opportunity nationally to reject their king. Right. So right. w- how else would you say? Explain? No, no, I, I like that. I, I was just going to say this this chart is so good. So whenever you're reading chapter 11 of John there, have this in your hand and you'll get it right. Yeah. So that's my answer to the question, John 11, mm-hmm. is that a rapture passage? Yes, sir. All right. Let's go on to question four. This is the millennial kingdom. And I'm hoping this won't take us a thousand years to answer this one, but go ahead. <laughs> All right, we'll see. Uh, question four. We have a friend who, do, who does not believe the millennium will be an actual thousand-year kingdom. He believes that the eternal kingdom begins at Jesus' second coming. This, this is very common. Uh, they have this idea that Jesus is going to come back and boom, there's going to be heaven or the eternal state. And don't, don't bother me with this thousand year issue. Mm-hmm. Well, the problem is I'm not bothering you with the thousand year <laughs> issue. It's God <laughs> who's bothering you with yeah. the thousand year issue. Yes. And if you go to <laughs> Revelation 20 and you look at verse 1, it says, Then I saw. Mm-hmm. In other words, when it says, then I saw, it's demarcating a new prophetic event. Yeah. And then from verse 1 to verse 10, you have a description of the millennial kingdom. And then if you go to Revelation 20, verse 11, it says, then I saw. So that's Mm -hmm. giving us a new prophetic event, which goes down to verse 15, the great white throne judgment. And then if you go to Revelation 21, verse 1, it says, Then I saw, and you have a brand new prophetic event, which is the new heavens and the new earth. So I guess my point is the Holy Spirit, when he keeps saying, "Then I, John writing under the Spirit's guidance, then I saw, then I saw, then I saw, he's, is he separating mm-hmm. the second <laughs> advent from the millennial kingdom, from the great white throne judgment, from the eternal state. Mm -hmm. And if you won't follow the language here and allow the Lord to demarcate those events, then you might as well not see any difference between the great white throne judgment and the eternal state, Mm -hmm. for that matter. So these are successive events then? Successive. Mm -hmm. Chronological, that's that's what it means when it says, then I saw. Now, when he describes the millennial kingdom, he does that in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 10. And he uses there the term a thousand years. Yes, he does. You know, not once, not twice, not three times, but six Six times. Six times, right. So you'll look at verse, end of verse 2, a thousand years, Revelation 20. Verse Mm -hmm. 3, the thousand years. End of verse 4, they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Uh, verse, uh, I'm sorry, that was the end of verse 4. Verse 5, not until the thousand years were completed. Mm -hmm. Verse 6, they reigned with him a thousand years. Verse 7, when the thousand years are completed. I mean, it says it over and over and over and over again. The the Greek word for thousand is kilia. That's why the early believers in a future millennium were called kiliasts. Mm -hmm. Today we call them premillennialists. Right. Uh, millennium, when they started to debate these things in Latin, the name milli in Latin is a thousand, and right. anna means years. So kilia or kilias took on the designation millennium, and a premillennialist is someone who believes Jesus comes back first, Revelation 19, and then the thousand years begins. Mm-hmm. So, you know, your friend doesn't see a distinction according to this question, between the thousand years and the eternal state, but the, but the Bible sees a distinction right. for reasons I've tried to explain. Yes. There is a tremendous movement today 
to use what I would call the ram, jam, and cram method of interpretation, where you just take all these prophetic events and you kind of put them in a blender, and they're all the same. Uh And my point is, folks, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says there is a world of difference between the millennium and the eternal state. Right. The millennium is in Revelation 20. The eternal state is in Revelation 21 and 22. You'll notice from this chart, in the millennium, mm-hmm. sin is removed. In the etern- uh, it's restrained, I should say. Mm-hmm. In the eternal state, sin is removed. In the millennium, the curse is restrained. In the eternal state, the curse is removed. In the millennium, you still got death. In the eternal state, there is no death. In the millennium, you've got mortals and resurrected people living together. Mm -hmm. So tribulation saints, tribulation martyrs, Old Testament saints are going to be resurrected at the beginning. We as the church uh, who have received our resurrected bodies at the point of the rapture are returning with the Lord Mm -hmm. and we're ruling and reigning. But there are people that survived the tribulation right? and they're still living in non-resurrected bodies. Right. And those that are believers go into the millennium and repopulate the earth. Yes. And so the sin nature gets passed down. Mm -hmm. So the millennium is quite interesting. You've got mortals and resurrected people dwelling together. Right. But in the eternal state, there's only going to be resurrected people. In the millennium, you still have to evangelize. Yes. Not in the eternal state. Evangelization won't be needed. The millennium is a renovation of this current world. The eternal state is an ex nihilo, something out of nothing, brand new creation. Mm -hmm. The millennium is temporary. The eternal state is eternal. The millennium is transitionary. The eternal state is non-transitionary. Look at this second chart here. In the millennium, you have time, (coughs) thousand years, but the eternal state goes on forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's eternal. It's eternal. (laughs) Hence the name eternal state. The millennium, there's going to be luminaries, the sun and the moon and the stars. Mm -hmm. In fact, the sun is going to be seven times brighter than what it currently is, according to Isaiah 30, verse 26. So get your suntan lotion ready. I was going to say, maybe I I can finally get a good tan. Yes, but in the eternal state, there's no luminaries at all Mm -hmm. because the sun, not S-U-N, But the S-O-N illuminates everything. In the millennium, there's a brick-and-mortar temple with animal sacrifices. No temple in the eternal state. In the millennium, there's death Mm -hmm. amongst the survivors, the mortals that survive the tribulation and are believers. They die. Some die. Um, But the eternal state, there's no death. In the millennium, Satan is active. He's let out of his cage, Uh, his abyss. Mm -hmm. And he incites a rebellion, but that won't happen in the eternal state. He'll be in the lake of fire forever. In the millennium, there's rebellion, but no rebellion in the eternal state. So I think it's very sad, Brother Jim, when people just flippantly, like this particular person that the questioner is writing about, just kind of jam it all together and say, oh, there's just this uh, eternal order at the end. I I would call it this. The millennium is the son's kingdom. Mm -hmm. The eternal state is the father's kingdom. And what Mm -hmm. Jesus does at the end of his successful thousand-year reign, that's the only utopia you want to be a part of, by the way, is he's going to take his kingdom and hand it over to the Father, and the two are going to merge. But that doesn't happen until the thousand years are completed. There's actually a prophecy about that in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. (coughs) And what does that say? 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, uh, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. So that's when the two merge at the end of the thousand years, but they don't merge beforehand. Right. And so, folks, let's let the Bible say what it wants to say. Let's not jam it all together. Well, th- well, that's the, I'm so glad you finished with that because <laughs> the truth of the matter is if you look at these two charts, if, if words mean anything, yeah, right. right, in order to make these two separate events the same event, you have to twist Scripture. Yep. Y- you don't have a choice. Mm-hmm. I've got a problem, Brother Jim, with these group of people that have now 
take an influence in our formerly dispensational schools. Yeah. They call themselves progressive yeah. dispensationalists. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they are neither progressive nor dispensationalists, in my opinion. Right. They're regressive. Mm -hmm. They're going back to re replacement theology, reform theology. Well, they, that's exactly and they're not following the tenets of dispensationalism. Right. But they don't have seven dispensations. They have four. And they take the millennial kingdom in the eternal state and they merge it together under what they call in their charts a Zionic dispensation. That sounds good. <laughs> and they're they're merging together things. You know, the book of Leviticus, for example, it's pretty clear. Don't mix things together uh, that don't yes. belong together. Yes. Don't mix Israel and the church. Don't mix uh, millennial mm -hmm. kingdom and eternal state. And these guys, they mm -hmm. just mix them together, and they don't have any, you know, they don't have any, you know, they just do it, and they don't seem to suffer much remorse. Well, they don't have the authority to do it, number yeah. one. And number two, as we just said, that in order to do that, they're twisting Scripture. Yeah, and this is how you kind of suck up, if I can use mm -hmm. that expression, to the reform community. Mm -hmm. Because they don't really have an earthly kingdom at all. Right. And what they're right. saying is, look how flexible mm -hmm. we are. We can we can sit down at the table with you and dialogue. We mm -hmm. can We can merge the two together, and we're kind of almost where you are, although not completely. Mm hmm and um, let's 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 be careful, people, with what we're doing to the Word of God. But well, that reminds me of what Israel was doing, you know. But when it began to want to be more like the nations <laughs> yeah. around them, yeah. didn't end well for them. No, and they got Saul <clears throat> with that kind of mentality. That's true. Who, who came from <clears throat> the wrong tribe? Yep. The tri the kings are supposed to come from Judah. Saul came from Benjamin, but he looked right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if they just handsome. hung out with the Lord, they would have gotten a, a man after God's own heart. He, he had Come, him in waiting, didn't he? He had him in waiting. He didn't look all that. <laughs> you know, when the man of God came to anoint the next king, um, bring out the kids. <laughs> and they didn't even bring out David. Yeah, he was he out just, in the field. He just wasn't hip and muscular and <laughs> didn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But And I heard you quote this earlier today as we were in counseling with somebody, God doesn't look at the outer. <laughs> That's right. He looks at That's the heart. Right. That's and right. so um, anyway. <clears throat> thank goodness. We Thank goodness. And we, we digress. Let's see if we can sneak in. Um, you ready to talk about the NAR? And the I think new, we better. The new apostolic <clears throat> movement? <clears throat> sure, why not? Let's, let's do question number five, see if we can slip this in. <laughs> All right, question we, number five. We may never get out of this one. I don't know. Friends of mine are believers in the New Apostolic Reformation, also called the NAR, and the Seven Mountains Mandate, and present-day apostles and prophets. We pray together for our country and for others. When they begin to pray, they say, I decree the blood of Christ over such and such. Are they addressing the Lord inappropriately? So you're, you're praying with a Christian and... You think you've got fellowship with that Christian because we're all Christians, but then you discover they're a member of the New Apostolic Reformation, and when they pray, they're commanding things and mm -hmm. decreeing things, mm -hmm. whereas when you pray, you're humbly petitioning. Yes. Um, and this shows you that you got to watch your eschatology because it's going to affect other things, even your prayer life. It sure will. So what do we mean by the seven mountain mandate? We have the picture here of the seven mountains. These, this is basically a movement. Um, Bethel Church of Redding, California is knee deep in this. Um, Lance Wallnow mm -hmm. is knee deep in this. And it's this idea that Christians are going to come into the world and they're going to reclaim the seven mountains. Yeah. Um, what was the fellow's name that started uh, YWAM? I think his last name was Cunningham. I think that's right. Lauren Cunningham mm -hmm. was knee deep into this. Bill Bright, towards the end of his life, got knee deep into all this stuff. Yeah. And so the Christians are going to take over business, government, family, religion, media, education, entertainment. And you can, it's sort of laughable because. I don't think they're making a lot of progress in media or entertainment. Hmm. 
Did you notice or education? What, did you notice what passage of scripture they're basing this on? No, right? tell us about that. Well, yeah. let's see what it says here. Take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. And gee, where does that come from? Joshua chapter one verse eleven. That sounds real churchy. Yeah. Well, do I need to walk seven times around the walls? I mean, if we're going to take that for what it says, that seems like that. And what walls law. is it? Is that is that media or is that Jericho? Mm. Um, anyway, you can see the problems know. you get into with this. But this is called yeah. the Seven Mountains Mandate. Yeah. I mm. would call it this post-millennialism. We're pre-millennial, mm-hmm. meaning you're not going to have the kingdom until the king comes. That's right. They're post-millennial, meaning they're going to take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they believe. Excuse me. And Sorry. they're going to basically, through taking over these seven mountains, they're going to bring the world into apple pie order. Yeah. And Jesus is going to come back and say, great, thanks for doing that heavy lifting for me. And then he returns post after the thousand years of success of the church in subduing the culture. Didn't Hitler try that? (laughs) I think so. You know, I was walking out of church once with a bunch of Christians who couldn't even decide where as a group they were going to go eat lunch and I thought to myself, we can't even get this figured out. How are we going to take over these <laughs> seven mountains? You can't find the right re- <laughs> restaurant. That takes care of business. You're out of there, That's right? right? So this is how they interpret Revelation <clears throat> 20, verse 4. Can you read Revelation 20, verse 4? Yes, sir. Revelation 24 through 6. You want just verse 4 or all of it? Uh, why don't you just read... Um, I think this on this slide is just verse 4. So just read oh, what's okay. on the slide. Sorry. Yeah. All right, number 4, le- uh, verse 4 here. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been re- beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, we believe this happens when Jesus comes back at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Right. They believe it's happening now. Yeah. They believe that the church is ruling and reigning now as we speak, and we just need to claim our promises and take over these seven, you know, these seven mountains. Mm-hmm. Now, I, countless Christians believe this. It's a bad, it's a post-millennial eschatology. Well, and this is, Pastor, this is just an evolution of yeah. Word of Faith teaching. Let and and, ex- right and explain that. And you, and well, I don't mind, <clears throat> maybe you can go into more detail, but, I mean, you, you spent 20 years. <laughs> About 20 years in that. In yeah. the Word of Faith movement. So explain well, what, what well, you mean by again, that. Again, this whole idea of. And he's not still in know, the Word of Faith no, movement. I mean, he's well, com- I'm in the Word of God now. <laughs> right? But, yeah, you know, the, the idea that you could command things into existence and command God to do things that uh, because we have all this authority and power that we can change the world and get it ready for Christ. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing. They've just repackaged it now, and they're calling it NAR. Yeah. And they make for very strange bedfellows. They do. You have post-millennial <laughs> theologians who are Calvinists and cessationists mm-hmm. hanging around with Bob Tilton and yeah. Bethel and all of these hyper charismatic Copeland and these kind Cope. of guys. And you ask yeah. yourself, well, what do they have in common? They have what they have in common is post millennialism. Right. Right. And if you're a post millennialist, it's going to change how you pray. You're decreeing. Because mm-hmm. after all, you're already ruling and reigning. Right. So why not decree yeah. things into existence? That's why this person is praying with an NAR member who also believes there are modern-day apostles and prophets. Surprise, surprise. Eh? And, you know, if you're a modern-day apostle and prophet, you look really good for your age because you ought to be about <laughs> 2,000 years yeah, old by now because yeah, there's right. a technical definition of who's an apostle, someone that was saw the risen Christ, exactly. et cetera. And by the way, the foundation of the church was built with the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2, verse 20. Right. Talk to anybody in construction, and they'll tell you the foundation of a building is laid a single time. One time. 
So you dismiss this, you move into the NAR, you move into, which is just recycled post-millennialism, mm-hmm. and now you're commanding God in your prayer life. Right. You're decreeing things into existence. Imagine that. And I don't think that we're to pray this way because we're, if you look at this slide here, living in the devil's world. I mean, he's still the prince of this world, the God of this age, the prince and power of the air. I mean, this if, if he weren't, why put on the armor of God? Mm-hmm. He roams about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The whole world, you know, lies in the lap of the wicked one. And so Jesus hasn't come yet. He, Jesus has paved the way for the kingdom to come. Right. Through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension 2,000 years ago, but he hasn't come and established his kingdom yet. Right. We're in the church age, not the kingdom. Exactly. And that should shape the way we pray. By the way, Brother Jim, this is why we are called heirs of the kingdom in the New Testament. Did you know that? What does James 2 verse 5 say? James 2 verse 5 says, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? So we're called heirs of the kingdom. I like that. Which is a statement that makes no sense if we're in the kingdom. Exactly. Yeah. And since we're mere heirs of the kingdom, that's why we're called ambassadors. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, if I'm America's ambassador to Iran, I'm representing American values in Iranian territory. Right. I'm not there to bring America through regime change Mm -hmm. and topple the government of Iran. So we're called ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. We represent kingdom values in in a world where the kingdom of God hasn't been... Expressed yet, right? Or established, yeah. Because it's Satan's world currently. Imagine an ambassador going to another country <laughs> and decreeing things to the local government yeah. there. I don't think that would work out no, too well. No, no. So all of that to say, w- w- this is why Jesus, when he developed the church age truths in the upper room discourse, said things like this in John fifteen verses eighteen and nineteen. John 15, 18, and 19, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. See, when Jesus began to articulate foundational principles for the church... Since Israel had rejected their king in John 12, Mm -hmm. now he's in the upper room Mm -hmm. revealing the church age. He tells the disciples, you're not going to go out into the world here and take over the seven mountains. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Jesus will take take over the seven mountains when he comes back. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know, do a word study on seven mountains. You know who the seven mountains are connected to? In the book of Revelation, they're connected to the Antichrist. Yes. <laughs> yes. Revelation 17. Yeah. So if you're a Christian going out and trying to subdue the seven mountains, you're building the kingdom of the Antichrist. That's exactly right. So when Jesus sent out the disciples from the upper room, he said, you're going into the world. The world's going to hate you. Mm-hmm. And if it weren't so... Uh, don't don't get upset. They hated me before it hated you. Right. And you, if you were of the world, if you were of entertainment, if you were of Hollywood, then they would embrace you. Right. So that kind of statement there is antithetical to the Seven Mountains mentality. Completely. So so how how then are we supposed to pray? I mean, if we're not in the kingdom now, and postmillennialism is incorrect. And we're not decreeing things into existence. How are we supposed to pray? Well, Jesus told us how to pray Mm -hmm. in Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. Flippantly called the Lord's Prayer, but this is not the Lord's Prayer. This is actually the disciples' prayer. Right. And what does he say there? Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's how you pray. The first three clauses here 
our prayers for the kingdom to come. Mm-hmm. Well, why would you pray for the kingdom to come if it's already here? Yeah, duh. It, duh. Right. <laughs> so yeah. what he says is pray mm-hmm. in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. When is God's name going to be hallowed or respected? When the kingdom comes. Right. And by the way, you'll see that in Isaiah 29, verse 23, which you don't have, but I have on my sheet here, and Ezekiel 36, verse 23. Don't expect God's name to be respected on this earth until the kingdom comes. Right. Then you're to pray, number two, thy kingdom come. And then you're to pray, number three, that God's will would be done on earth as it already is being done in heaven. Mm -hmm. God isn't second-guessed in heaven. He's not outvoted. Right. So pray that that heavenly reality becomes an earthly reality, and that won't happen until the kingdom comes. That's why in Daniel 7 Mm -hmm. it says, in the days of those kings, the ten-king confederation of the Antichrist, the God of heaven... Mm-hmm. This is the stone cut without human hands mm. will establish a kingdom that will not end. Yes. So Jesus is saying, pray for that. Yes. Now, until the kingdom comes, you've got some needs. The first need you have is for your daily bread because we're living in a world of malnutrition, starvation, deprivation, depression, recession. So pray that your needs will be met. Give us this day our daily breads, bread. And you're not in a resurrected body yet, so you got to send nature. Yeah. So pray that God would and be, be forgiving towards people. And if you're forgiving towards people, then that enhances your personal fellowship with the Lord, mm-hmm. I think is what he's saying there. And then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Evil here is the evil one. Right. Pray for protection from Satan. I won't need to pray that in the kingdom because Satan will be bound. Right. So this whole prayer is structured around a mindset that says we're not in the kingdom yet. You can't miss that if you just read. Right. And um, get Dr. Two Saints' book, his commentary on Matthew, Behold the King. Yeah. And he lays this out. Um as beautifully as it could be laid out. And also, we're to pray in accordance with 1 John 5, verse 14, which says what? 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So the question is... Does belief in the new apostolic reformation alter your prayer life? Yes, it does. It does. And you need to pray intelligently, and you can't pray intelligently until you get over this ridiculous idea that we're in the kingdom now or, mm-hmm. or bringing in the kingdom. Right, right. All right. Well, if I'm decreeing things, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, again, when I was in the word faith movement, this was something that we were constantly being told to do, you know, name it and claim it, decree yeah. it, cause that. Well, well, where is God's will in all of that? Doesn't sure. doesn't God have something to say about what I should and shouldn't pray for? Yeah. Well, I thought so. And <clears throat> do you really want your will? I've had my <laughs> will. <laughs> and I can tell you, no, I don't want my will. Yeah. I mean, we if we got everything we wanted, we would totally mess up everything. Unquestionably. Unquestionably. And who do you want running your life? An omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God whose nature is un- incorrupted? Or you? Um, There it is. There's a country western song, isn't there? Thank God for unanswered prayer. Well, if there isn't, there (laughs) ought to be. (laughs) All right. So we got ten questions. We made it through five. We're going to stop here. We've covered the fullness of the Gentiles, the gap, alleged possible gap between the rapture and the tribulation. Is John 11 a rapture passage is there going to be a millennium and how does post-millennial new apostolic reformation thought damage the way we pray and don't miss next time because you know what we're going to talk about next time whether annihilationism is true i mean when you die don't you just explode and cease to exist as an unbeliever wow what about the age of accountability what about people that can't make a decision for christ 
or believe in him because they don't have the mental capacity. Mm-hmm. Or um, aborted babies. Aborted babies. Mm-hmm. What about people in so, uh, some <laughs> unreached area of the world that have never heard the gospel? You don't really think God is just going to send all those people to hell, are you? Mm-hmm. Oh, and number nine, boy, we might burn the house down with this one. <laughs> what do you have to do to be justified? Do you have to repent and believe? ruh Talk about that. And what do you do with... Um, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 2 saying people have believed in vain. Wow. What do you do with that? So do us a favor if you could. Um, if you've got future questions, submit them to andywoodsministries.org. You should find a, a way to contact us via email on my website, www.andywoodsministries.org or you can uh, send them to the contact form at Sugarland Bible Church, www.slbc.org. I asked mm-hmm. Janet, who compiles yeah. all these things for us, if I could had permission to do that. <laughs> if you want these show notes, which are going to cover this week and next week, um, sign up for our newsletter at andywoodsministries.org. Just go to the homepage, and you should see an easy way at the top there to sign up for our newsletter if you're watching this on facebook and you agree with the message we would just ask you to hit like and share and expand our reach into your friends list and this presentation is going to be very quickly loaded up to my youtube channel just go to andy woods type andy woods into your youtube search engine and you should be able to find it very quickly Um, We would invite you to like and subscribe to that YouTube channel. That YouTube channel reaches an awful lot of people, which we're very grateful for. And if the tech (coughs) tyrants get nasty and start to cancel us, um, you can find these pastor's point of view presentations on my Rumble channel. Just go to Andy Woods Ministries. Make sure your settings are connected or set on channels. And you should be able to find me there on uh, Rumble. So we're going to come back next week, and we're going to answer the remaining five questions. Do you have anything you want to? Well, the only thing I can say is, Pastor, you've you've made this episode like an old-time serial with a cliffhanger. <laughs> and right. I can't wait to get to question number six, so be sure and join us. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. God bless, God bless you.